All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to the last Sunday series uh, presentation. My name is Sarah Ryder, and I am a member of the District 10 Como Community Council. Each year, um, we each year, uh, the Como Community Council puts on a number of Sunday series presentations. And this year, we started February 27th, and today is the last one. Um, you can find all of our past ones, um, and we also record all of the presentations. So you can go back and watch the other ones. You can find them on our website, uh, district 10 comopark.org, on our Facebook page, um, or on our weekly newsletter. And I will also post it a link in the chat for anybody that is interested. Um, we will be having a presentation, and at the end of the presentation, we will have some time for a QA. Um, I just ask everyone to please mute your microphone. And like I said, we'll have a moment at the end for questions. So today we will be hearing um, from Dr. Kim Hikula, and um, she is the author of the Booth, Booth Girls. Um, and the Booth Girls, Pregnancy, Adoption, and the Secrets We Kept. So I will mute myself now and hand it off. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, thank you all for coming here. Um, yes, I am Kim Hakela. Um, and I'm just very happy to be invited to be part of this series. I've been looking at through some of the recordings of previous presentations and I'm happy to be part of the program. So thank you for inviting me and thank you to all of you for coming, um, coming <laughs> from your home or wherever you happen to be as we're joining uh, via Zoom. So I am actually gonna share my screen. And I told Sarah, as I logged on, I have quite a, quite a nasty cough has developed in the past week or so. So I'm going to, once I start sharing my screen, um, I am going to turn off my camera, just in case I do have a little coughing thing, you don't have to witness that in the little you know, corner of your screen. And I may from time to time mute myself. Um, I have cough drops all around me and water and all that kind of stuff. So I'm just gonna take care of business here, but I think yeah, it should be fine. I think we'll, um, we'll get through the presentation here. So there, I'm gone. Um, at least visually, but I am going to share my screen here and uh, talk you through a, a slideshow to talk about the history of Booth Memorial Hospital, which you all currently know as the Booth Brown House. Okay, let me get this going here. All right, we should be good. Just make sure my camera's off, my sound is on. Oops, there we go. Okay, so yes, I am, as Sarah said, here to talk about what is now the Booth Brown House and what I focused on its years, its 75 year history as Booth Memorial Hospital, both of which are run by the Salvation Army. Um, but before I give you the highlights of that story of this history of Booth, I'll just call it Booth for short because it can apply to either incarnation, I want to explain a little bit about how I came to study it. And that starts with a personal story. I have a personal connection to Booth. So I grew up believing that I was my mother's first child. I grew up, you know, with me and my younger brother, I was born in 1968, he was born in 1970. And so, you know, for 26 years, I thought that I was my mom's first child. But in fact, I was not. She had actually had her first daughter at Booth Memorial Hospital in January of 1961. My mom had gotten pregnant during her junior year at the University of Minnesota. She was single and had dated the father of her baby for only a few weeks. And uh, when she told him that she was pregnant, he hightailed it out of her life and away from any responsibility. So he was not part of the picture at all. Um, I'll talk a little bit in a little bit more detail about what, what my mother did in the immediate aftermath or the early months of her pregnancy. Um, as, as I go through the presentation here, but suffice it to say now that she ended up, she got pregnant in the spring of 1960, and on New Year's Eve of that year, she reported to Booth, um, you know, just a few weeks before her due date, spent a couple weeks there in the company of other girls who were, quote, in trouble, and then delivered her baby on January 16th, 1961, uh, excuse me. And then she kept that secret for 33 years 
She did not. My father knew. She met and married my father in 1963. He knew. Um, and of course, my mom's family knew, which I'll talk a little bit about as we go here. But nobody else knew. For 33 years, she kept us a secret. But in 1994, she was finally setting it free because that daughter that she had had at Booth had come back into her life. My sister had hired a searcher to find her birth mother, my mom. And in late June of 1994, the two were reunited. And that's the photograph you see here is when my sister came back. Um, she was living in Michigan at the time and still is and came back to meet my mom. Now, a few days after this photograph was taken, my mom told me and then later my brother Eric about our sister. She also told us that our sister who, as I said, lived in Michigan was coming to Minnesota again to meet us. And she also told us that our sister was named Kim, <laughs> which is my name. So my brother has two sisters named Kim. And just for the record and for clarity's sake, I will note that it was Kim's adoptive parents who named her Kim. So I was not kind of the second Kim in line named by my mother. Okay, so that's um, kind of the personal, the origins of, of the book and of my story. So for the last 15 years of my mother's life, all three of her children were part of it. Kim Sr., as we call her, Kim Jr., me and my brother Eric. And added to that pretty small family were two grandsons. Kim's son, Christopher, was born in February of 1995. You see him here in that middle picture with the curly hair. And my husband and I adopted our son from Vietnam in 2006. My mother, who always described herself as not being a, quote, baby person, became a really doting, loving grandmother to my son. Kim and her family were still living in Michigan. She just didn't see them as much as, of course, she saw me and my son and my husband. She, my mom, stocked her house with toys and booster seats and sippy cups and animal crackers, all the stuff that kids love. She brought my son to the beach, to the pool, to the museum. She introduced him to his first movie, gave him his first taste of pop, which was a Diet Coke at that movie. <laughs> and he was little. I was not necessarily thrilled about that. Um, but she entertained him with love and patience and spelled me from the stresses of new motherhood. <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> there we go. And she would likely have been this grandmother to any child that was brought into the family, but I have to think that there was something special for her in having a chance to know and love another mother's adopted away child. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then in September 2008, my mom was diagnosed with terminal pancreatic cancer. The doctors gave her six months. And on February 9th, about five and a half months later, 2009, she died at her home in St. Paul. And my son, too, with whom, again, she was very close, was three and a half years old. Adjusting to life without my mom <clears throat> was, of course, painful. But, you know, life, life goes on. One day, one month, one year turned into the next. Uh-oh, excuse me, just a sec. <coughs> um, I'm going to mute myself, just whoops. can't find it. Anyway, excuse me. <coughs> so I was busy. And after my mom died, I had a little kid. I was teaching at St. Kate's. I was um, finishing up my first book. So I was just kind of plowing through life. Kim was still in our lives. We were still connected to her. But after my first book came out in 2011, I started uh, wondering if and how my mother's first experience with motherhood the one that was filled with shame and that resulted in the loss of her first child, how that might have affected her parenting of me. And I was doing this as I was struggling with motherhood myself and raising this little boy. <clears throat> I started wondering what it must have been like for her during those first months of her pregnancy, during those weeks at Booth, and during the days and months and years that she had kept her secret. And I was brought up short by the fact that I who was a historian of women in the post-World War II United States and an oral historian to boot, had not asked my mother these questions when I'd had the chance. We were so focused on Kim's arrival in the present and then the subsequent dailiness of living that I missed the opportunity to really listen to or even ask about my mother's story. And then she was gone. So a few years after her death, <clears throat> 
pardon me, a year after my first book came out, I decided my next project would focus on trying to unearth her story in her absence. Oh dear, hang on just a sec here. I'm trying to find the mute button and I can't find it. <coughs> oh dear. Okay, so sorry for just skimming through these slides so fast as I'm looking for that mute. So in 2012, a project was born. <coughs> I worked with the Minnesota Independent Scholars Forum who secured two legacy grants to support my research. Um, one of those grants was an or oral history grant. <coughs> oh dear. And one supported my travel to <clears throat> Alexandria, Virginia to look at the Salvation Army National Archives. St. Catherine University also supported my research. And these grants, these funds allowed me <clears throat> to do a deep dive into the history, as far as I could, into the history of Booth, Booth Memorial Hospital, both at the University of Minnesota and the Social Welfare History Archives, the Minnesota Historical Society, and as I said, the Salvation Army Archives in Alexandria, Virginia, and in other archives across the country. And then about a year ago, in March of 2021, my book came out. This book that took all these years to write, to research, um, finally came out a year ago. And it is a story that, the book is a story that traces my mother's history in and out of this larger history of Booth Memorial Hospital, as well as kind of the cultural response to single pregnancy in the middle of the 20th century in Minnesota and in the United States more generally. <clears throat> um, I will also say about the book uh, that it, it blends writing styles and genres. So I'm a historian by training. I decided I was gonna try to learn about my mother through the skills that I had as a historian. So I did all this research, but my mother was also a writer and she, she started writing about her experiences, you know, with this first pregnancy after my sister came back into her life. And so the book, each chapter starts with an excerpt from my mother's own writing about her experiences as a single or a quote unwed mother and her time at Booth. Um, and then I interviewed seven other women who were single and pregnant <coughs> and had their babies at Booth and, and had those children adopted by other people. So their stories are part of the book. And then I also incorporated a bit of my own adoption story, my husband and my own adoption story about how our family was formed through transracial and transnational adoption. Um, and then there's some creative writing in the book as well. So the book really blends as many tools as I could find and use to try to understand this experience that my mother had had with motherhood, as well as my own. And both of those were kind of defined through the lens of adoption. So that is what the book is about. But today, I'm gonna to focus mostly on the history of Booth. Um, and I'll leave my mother's story in and out of this history a little bit, but primarily we'll talk about the history of Booth Memorial Hospital. So Booth's story begins with the Salvation Army, uh, an organization that combines street theater and public charity work with religious proselytizing to try to bring the masses to Christianity. One of its programs early on, it was formed in the latter half of the 19th century in the UK. Um, and one of its programs was to help quote, fallen women. And by fallen women, they meant poor women. They meant homeless women. They meant women who may have had substance abuse or addiction issues. They meant prostitutes. They meant the sexually deviant, which at that time often simply meant the sexually active and they meant the unwed mother. The army opened its first rescue home for fallen women in London in 1884, and its first in the United States in New York City in 1886. The army viewed the women as victims, usually of predatory men, who if given the opportunity would choose to live a more wholesome life. Salvation Army lassies would visit brothels and saloons and patrol the streets in search of women who they thought might benefit from this opportunity. 
Now, the Salvation Army <clears throat> extended its work with fallen women to Minnesota in 1898 when it opened a rescue home in St. Paul at University Avenue and Jackson Street. And that's this kind of fuzzy photo that you see on the screen now. A 1901 article about the rescue home in the St. Paul Globe said that the function of the home was, quote, to rebuild and reconstruct into its lost shape and pattern the torn and mangled fabrics of ruined lives of girls. <laughs> very purple prose at the time, very in keeping with the journalistic style of the day. Now this goal also reflected larger Salvation Army policy towards its female clientele. And one way it sought to achieve this goal for these young women was by installing Salvationist women in the homes to serve as sisterly or motherly role models for the women inmates, as they were called. The army tried to uplift these fallen girls by providing the loving, forgiving maternal care that they clearly had lacked in their own homes, and then would send them off to lead a clean, productive, and hopefully Christian life. So part of their <clears throat> mission, the Salvation Army and its women, was to um, serve as good Christian role models for these young women who needed some steering back onto a proper course. By 1904, the Army was operating 21 rescue homes in the United States and 120 of these homes across the globe. <clears throat> By 1912, this, um, excuse me, <clears throat> the Salvation Army rescue home was really bursting at the seams. By this time, um, attitudes towards prostitutes had changed and hardened a bit, and they were no longer seen as victims, but instead were seen as criminals. <coughs> so the social and public response to prostitutes was now starting to turn them towards the legal system. But the uh, rescue home was still catering to other women in need, and it was doing a robust business, as it were, by 1912. Um, <clears throat> single mothers and mothers-to-be were still viewed as victims of men, and they were, the Salvation Army looked at them as ruined but redeemable. They were more sympathetic than the supposedly disease-carrying predatory professional women who were um, working as prostitutes. Now, I want to point out, and you can see it on the slide here, this is from a 1912 report by the Salvation Army about the rescue home in St. Paul. And I wanna point out this line here. I think you can see my cursor. With regard to young women who showed up there and pregnant were pregnant and had their babies at the rescue home, the army policy was to insist that these girls keep, maintain and rear their own children. And they insisted on that because they thought that the practice of mothering, of caregiving, of taking care of a, a little baby was the way that these young, women who had erred would best redeem themselves. They would still be kind of marked by the stain of their illicit pregnancy, but it was gonna be the practice of mothering more than, or at least in addition to the good role modeling provided by these army women that would restore their good names as much as was possible. So in any case, by 1912, the needs of fallen women and unwed mothers had outgrown the space of the Salvation Army <clears throat> rescue home, <coughs> which by that time, as you can see here, had relocated to North Avenue in St. Paul. So Adjutant Earl here went on a massive PR and fundraising campaign to raise money so that the Salvation Army could buy and build its own home. This, these were rental properties until this point. And she attracted the attention and the support of many prominent Twin Cities businessmen and philanthropists, two of whom were the Elsinger brothers, William and Joseph Elsinger. Um, if, if you are at all familiar with St. Paul history, I was not until I did this, but the Elsinger brothers, uh, among their many other things, ran and the Golden Rule department store for many years in downtown St. Paul. They were quite wealthy. They were also, also philanthropists. They were very involved in local charitable initiatives. And they, they were Jewish, 
And the story goes that they were very willing to support this expansion of this maternity home because a young Jewish girl had shown up at the door of this rescue home, pregnant and in need, and the Salvation Army, despite the fact that it was a Christian organization, welcomed this young Jewish girl into the fold and took care of her. And the Elsingers heard this story and were so moved by it that they donated both the land and something, I think it was $50,000, which is an enormous sum at that time, to build this new home. Now, the Elsingers were also connected to other Minnesota luminaries, including Clarence Johnston, who you can see here turns out to be the architect of what eventually becomes known as the Booth Memorial Hospital. And you can see it's um, early days of construction here. Now, Clarence Johnston was the state architect. And though many of us think about, you know, uh, Cass Gilbert as being this very prominent architect from Minnesota, and of course he was, uh, during the peak of his career, Clarence Johnston was just as well known as Cass Gilbert. He and Gilbert were friends, they were colleagues and then competitors. And by the time Johnston was drawing up plans for the new Salvation Army Rescue Home, Gilbert had made his name as architect of the Minnesota State Capitol and moved on to other things. But Johnston had been de designated the state architect, um, which was a position that was dissolved eventually then in 1931. But over the course of his 50 plus year career, Johnston designed some of the most notable buildings in the state, including Stillwater Prison, Northrop Auditorium and Walter Library, Williams Arena at the University of Minnesota, the Glensheen Mansion in Duluth, St. Paul Central High School, the Agua Ching Sanitarium, and many other buildings. If you've been in the Twin Cities or in Duluth, you have seen a Clarence Johnston building, and he designed this new maternity home and rescue home. And he also incidentally designed the Golden Rule Department Store and the Elsinger Home on Summit Avenue. So these guys were all kind of running in a pack and they decided that they were gonna um, support the Salvation Army in building this new rescue home. This new home opened to great fanfare on October 29th, 1913. All of these local dignitaries and Salvation Army officers spoke to the assembled crowd before offering a, the curious in the crowd, a tour of the facility, which had accommodations for 45 adults, 30 infants, and 13 staff members. So, you know, quite a step up from these smaller locations that they had been renting. On October 30, 1913, a report by the St. Paul Pioneer Press quoted the Salvation Army Commissioner Anna Estel, who was in town for this uh, unveiling, who described the Salvation Army as a non sectarian movement whose work was, quote, to lift fallen girls out of the mire and into morality. And for the next 60 years, through changes in state and municipal regulations, obstetrical care practices, social work and psychology, and cultural mores, the Salvation Army attempted to do just that. By 1920, the Salvation Army you know, was doing a good business at the new location at 1471 Como Avenue, which is where you all are familiar with it because it's still there as now the Booth Brown House. But do note, and by this time, and this was happening at these rescue homes across the country, you know, the Salvation Army wasn't the only organization that was operating these rescue homes to help these fallen women. Other uh, religious organizations were doing that. The Florence Crittenden Association was doing these similar kinds of rescue homes. And by the 1920s, most of them, or many of them, had winnowed down the population of women they were serving to unwed, mother, unwed mothers only. And that was the case at Booth as well. So by the 19, 1920, 1921, when Brigadier Annie Cowden is in charge of the Salvation Army Rescue Home, it is catering solely to single unwed, single slash unwed mothers. And its policy is still at this time to never separate mother and child. That's a quote from an article in the Minneapolis Morning Tribune about the rescue home. Um, and Brigadier Cowden is saying, no, nope, you know, we, our goal is still to keep these mothers and children together. And she's saying, she's answering this question. She's offering this response 
in response to a question about, well, what about all these people who are looking for babies to adopt? And why aren't you at this rescue home helping these couples find children to adopt? And she says, no, no, no. Um, you know, our policy is to keep mothers and children together. At the time, there was a requirement that the women who gave birth at Booth, because Booth, unlike some of these other maternity homes, Booth was also a hospital. So these young women came and waited out their pregnancies in the residential part of the facility, but it was also a functioning hospital, so they could deliver their babies on site. Not all maternity homes were also hospitals, but Booth was. And so by the 1920s, we have increasing numbers of people looking for babies to adopt. And they're turning to places like Booth and these maternity homes and saying, hey, how about you? And Brigadier Cowden says, no, we are keeping these women together with their children. There was in place at the time a requirement that these mothers at these maternity homes, if they gave birth to a quote, illegitimate child at a maternity home, they had to stay in residence with that child for three months to nurse that child. So even these state or agencies that were kind of overseeing the operation of these maternity homes were really kind of recognizing the value of the bond between mother and child. And Brigadier Cotton says, no, no, after those three months, these mothers want to, you know, they want to keep and raise their children. So 1920s, policy is still to keep mother and child together. Now, what the other thing that's happening at this time is that the Evangelical Women of the Salvation Army and some of these other maternity homes that are also run by religious organizations are facing another challenge. And that is the encroachment, which is clearly how they viewed it, <laughs> of professional social workers. So social workers as a, as a, a class of professionals were kind of making a name or trying to make a name for this, themselves in the early years of the 20th century. They were really trying to make a case that they were gonna draw on the scientific expertise of similar kinds of fields of study and apply it to our social world. Um, so think about the progressive era, social workers were really a part of the progressive era movement. And this was also an avenue for women to turn their kind of um, social housekeeping skills into a profession that they could apply to the most pressing social issues of the day. And as they went through this process of trying to make a professional home for themselves, a professional name for themselves, they started looking at the problem of illegitimacy and these maternity homes as, a, as the organizations that had been set up to help these women who had become quote, illegitimately pregnant. And these social workers are starting to say, mm, you know, okay, thank you. It's all been well and good that these religious women are trying to role model and nurture these young women into righteous paths. But we have skills and expertise that is gonna, that we're gonna bring to bear on the problem, on the social problem of illegitimacy. So they're really starting to challenge what the Salvation Army women have been doing at a place like Booth. And they're saying that, you know, it's not enough just to um, serve as a role model of Christian propriety. Instead, we are gonna come in and we are going to provide individualized casework counseling for these young women so that we can help them adapt to their proper social roles. So these social workers were less interested in these young women's spiritual salvation and more interested in their ability to function in society. What these social workers also did was they started shifting their perspective towards the children who were born to these mothers. <laughs> if these evangelical women had really looked at the babies as a way for these women to redeem themselves, social workers started saying, you know what? Our main goal, our main priority has to be the children, less so the mothers. They were still interested in the mothers, but they wanted to ensure that these children would have all of the life opportunities that children born to a married couple would have to the extent that that was possible. 
And sometimes they also viewed these mothers as a threat to these children. Excuse me. So now we see attitudes and understandings shifting about how these young women had become pregnant outside the bounds of marriage. If the Salvation Army in the early years viewed these young women as victims of predatory men, in the, as the decades of the 20th century wear on, um, the, the attitude towards them starts to change and they say, well, no, you know, they are, they are not fitting their proper social roles or products of bad environments. Um, so we're gonna both try to improve the environment and then help them adapt to their proper social roles. As we move into the 20s and 30s, we start talking about single pregnant women as um, either perhaps delinquents and or feeble-minded. <clears throat> so some of the attitudes among social welfare professionals was that these young women who had the mm, gall to become sexually active outside of marriage may have done so because they just were feeble-minded. They were not, there was something inherently and biologically wrong with them. <clears throat> So this was also the era where we have eugenic sterilization because social welfare experts did not want these feeble-minded young women to propagate themselves. So they were sent to places also like the Sox Center Home School for Girls where they were doing mandatory sterilization of some of these young women. So as we see you know, the operation of these maternity homes shift towards social workers, we also see different explanations for why these women are becoming pregnant and therefore different understandings of how we best take care of them and their children because <clears throat> we don't want, we being um, proper society, don't want the women or their children to become reliant on social, on public funds, right? So there's also an economic interest here. So, so there's a struggle for many years between these, these secular social workers who, who are coming into these rescue and maternity homes and saying, hey, we can better address the concerns of the mothers and children in these homes. And for a long time, the Salvation Army really resists that. There's some great tension among these parties. But, <clears throat> excuse me a minute. Beginning in 1940, the home, which is now finally known as Booth Memorial Hospital, is employing a full-time social worker. And in fact, the provision of adequate social service for residents by this time is a condition of the state's continuing support for licensing Booth as a maternity hospital. So social workers are in. By the time this photo is taken in 1946, social workers are part and parcel of what Booth is offering for these young mothers. <clears throat> and I will note that as the years go on, many Salvation Army women become social workers themselves. So what began as this real kind of um, <clears throat> era of conflict and tension eventually is absorbed into the Salvation Army itself. So now I'm gonna weave us back into my mother's story here a little bit because this is in the post-World War II period, that's where it starts to intersect with the history of Booth. <coughs> so in the 1950s, as we know, the nation was in the throes of the post-war baby boom, an era in which the white middle-class nuclear family took on huge social, political, economic, and moral significance in US culture. In 1957, at the peak of the baby boom, Nearly 12,000 babies were born every day, eight each minute. Hospital nurseries, pediatricians' offices, schools, suburbs, station wagons, playgrounds, parks, everything is just booming with these children. And the assumption <laughs> is that these children are born <clears throat> to happy, healthy, proper two-parent families. And within these families, women were to play a very prescribed role. Quote, good girls, graduated from high school, married shortly thereafter, even if they went to college, and fulfilled their biological, personal, and social destinies by becoming mothers. 
Mid-century Americans viewed unwed motherhood as a social, economic, and moral problem that demanded intervention for the sake of the baby, the mother, and the community. And so again, this is where my mom's story starts to intersect with this history. My mother was a good girl. <clears throat> she graduated from high school the same year the baby boom peaked. And by her own account, not mine, her own, she had been a very self-conscious young woman. She was a good student. She was shy. She was very involved in school activity. She didn't date much. She was tall for her age and for her gender. <clears throat> she was 5'10". So in high school, she was taller than a lot of the boys. She was self-conscious about that. Um, they might have been self-conscious about that as well. And so she didn't date much. Um, and she kind of describes those years as um, a combination of real happy times because she had lots of good friends and real uncomfortable times. Probably not unlike most of us would recall our teenage years. She graduates <clears throat> in 1957 and that fall <coughs> enrolls at the University of Minnesota. Excuse me, just a sec. <coughs> I'm so sorry. I'm going to just step away for a second because I can't find my mute. I'm going to grab a cough drop momentarily. Just a minute. Okay, sorry about that. So the other thing that's happening now during this time period is this other boom. So 1957, that same year that the, the overall baby boom peaked, that was also the first time that the number of babies born out of wedlock exceeded 200,000 in the United States. <coughs> the illegitimacy rate was triple what it was in 1940. And you can see that statistic there at the bottom of the screen that in Minnesota from 1960 to 1961, the rate of increase of babies born outside of marriage was, was increasing much more dramatically than the overall birth rate. <coughs> so there was this kind of two-pronged baby boom happening here. So I've been talking a little bit about how the understanding and explanation of unwed motherhood was changing over the years. And it's changing again in this post-war period. <coughs> now we have the rise of psychoanalytic theories that were attempting to explain why these young women were getting, getting pregnant outside of marriage. So the assumption at this time by social welfare experts, by psychologists, by psychiatrists, by child welfare experts, <coughs> was that these women were not, quote, born bad. So they weren't feeble-minded. They weren't the bad seeds. They weren't biologically destined to this illicit behavior, but instead that they were, they had some psychological dysfunction that led to a subconscious desire in them to become pregnant because that baby <coughs> would replace, become a love object and would replace the love that they hadn't gotten from their own families. So we're really trafficking in the language and analysis of psychoanalysis <clears throat> and neuroses. These women were said to be neurotic. You can see, and you can see the, the media picking up this, this story here, both in that top article, which is from the St. Paul Fire and Press in 1959, <clears throat> and in the bottom headline there from True Love Magazine, which is a national magazine in 1961. And you can see kind of in that, that uh, bottom headline there, 
you can see the author, Kenneth Eric, cycling through these previous understandings or explanations of unwed motherhood. What is she like? Is she criminal or stupid or just an innocent victim? All of those ideas had been culturally current in decades prior to this. But now, in that post-war period, the, <coughs> the explanation is that they are neurotic. Now, <clears throat> as we saw, our local media is picking up that story as well. And then in the fall, <coughs> excuse me, 1960, WCCO Television Reports does a half hour documentary series on Udwin Mothers, and they bring their cameras with Dave Moore. I remember Dave Moore when I was growing up, growing up in the 70s. He was a very well-known local TV news anchor. And Dave Moore brings, and WCCO bring their cameras into Booth. And they are doing this story about unwed mothers. <coughs> and he's very clear to say, look, these girls at Booth are not unlike the girls that you know. They're your sisters. They're your daughters. They're your neighbors. You know them. So they may have this, you know, kind of neuroses that they're trying to work out through this, sub, through this pregnancy, but let's be kind to them. So in some ways, this, this understanding of unwed motherhood is a little bit, or at least is intended to be more benign and more compassionate than previous explanations. They're not criminals. They're not, you know, biologically defective. They're not, they don't deserve to be sterilized. Instead, they have psychological dysfunction that can be treated through psychological casework counseling. <clears throat> so the explanation of the problem, of what leads to the problem of unwed pregnancy always suggests the solution. And that is where adoption comes in, which I'll talk about in just a second here. So at this time, you know, um, by the time this documentary airs on WCCO in the fall of 1960, my mom was pregnant. So she had been at the University of Minnesota. She was a junior studying journalism. And um, she, by her own account, again, said that when she was at the university, she really came into her, her own. She had lost weight. She was very attractive. She was a very um, beautiful woman. The boys had caught up to her in height. She was very popular. She started dating a lot while she was at the university, but she was still a good girl. You know, she had reserved her, um, her, uh, to use her virginity, quote, um, as long as she could. And then in the spring of 1960, she started dating one of her older brother's friends, a guy I'll call Jack. Jack was not a college boy. He was older than she was by a few years. He worked in construction. He had been married and divorced already. <coughs> in fact, he had a child already from that marriage. And mom was swept off her feet by this older man. He was her first sexual partner and she got pregnant in the spring of 1960. And as I said, when I started, um, you know, she is terrified when she learns that she's pregnant. She tells Jack, he flees the scene, never to be heard from again. My mother panics, you know, she is um, terrified at, at what has befallen her because this is such a shameful condition to be in at this time, right? She's falling well beyond that idealized white nuclear American family. And there are all these ideas circulating in the culture about, well, these girls are neurotic. You know, it may have been intended to be more compassionate, but nobody wants to be <clears throat> viewed as dysfunctional or as neurotic or as having such um, inner and outer now and very visible moral problems. So mom decides that she's not gonna tell anybody that she's pregnant. She fears the <coughs> reaction of her family and her, her community. So she finishes that spring semester and she gets on a Greyhound bus and goes to San Francisco 
And she decides she is going to raise, have her baby in California and raise it there by herself. She leaves a note for her family. She's one of six children. She has four younger brothers and sisters who are still at home. She's living at home with them. She leaves a note and says, I'm gonna go off in search of adventure um, and gets on this bus. She stays at the YWCA in San Francisco for a couple nights, realizes how overwhelming the situation is. She's having morning sickness. She feels terrible. She's scared and she decides she's gonna come back home. So she gets on the bus, comes back home, tells her parents they do not react well at all. They are ashamed and horrified that she has brought this shame onto the whole family. And so they, between the three of them, somehow decide that she's going to spend the most of her pregnancy hiding away in the uh, room under the eaves of their story and, and a half house in Blaine. And she is not to leave the house because, again, this is such a cause for embarrassment that she would bring shame upon their family. Now, my mom's family was kind of a working class family at this point. Um, they were aspiring to, to that solid footing in the middle class. They wanted to achieve the American dream like many other families did. And this was just going to be a black mark upon the whole household because one of the corollaries of this explanation that these women were neurotic was that their parents were to blame for their neuroses. And not just their parents, uh, kind of as a unit, but in particular, their mothers. So my grandmother was also feeling scrutinized by this public response to unwed pregnancy. There was a very prominent social worker writing at the time who said that women who became pregnant outside of wedlock did so to because they were trying to address the subconscious desire to find this love object because their own mothers had denied them the love that they needed. Their own mothers had failed to adapt properly to their own feminine roles and were themselves so disturbed that they had passed this, if not the genetic material, they had passed the psychological dysfunction onto their daughters who then become pregnant. So it's no wonder, no wonder that my grandmother was feeling a little bit um, uh, wary about what the public response would be to my mother's pregnancy. So my mom hides in that room for about six months until she is close to her due date at the end of 1960. And then she does report to Booth where she has her baby in January of 1961. Before she delivers her baby, she writes about having been there and kind of, um, you know, dusted the floors and, and washed the dishes in the company of all these other young women who were in residence. So one of the things that these girls did do while they were at Booth was work therapy. And you can see this quote here that comes from a presentation to the United Fund in the early 60s about what these young women did while they were at Booth. <laughs> That's not all they did. There was schooling options available for high school students. They could attend religious services. They had a smoker. <laughs> if you can believe that in the basement, my mom writes about going down to the smoker and has smoking cigarettes while they're pregnant, waiting out their deliveries. Um, there, and there were other, some, uh, some other programs that Booth offered as well. Now, by this time, as I've been saying, the explanation for unwed pregnancy suggests the solution. <coughs> and by this time, by 1960, 1961, when my mom is, is at Booth, the solution to unwed pregnancy was adoption. It was referred to as the best solution, meaning that adoption, having these children born to single women adopted by married couples was the best solution for the mother, the pregnant woman, because she would be able to put this ugly chapter behind her and go on to resume her life and follow that path that she was intended to follow. 
whether that meant go back to school, graduate high school if she was a high school student, go back to college if she was in college. And ultimately what that meant was to get married and have children as a married wife. Adoption was also gonna be the best solution for the child because the child would not be raised under the taint of illegitimacy. And that child would be raised in an economically secure two parent family. Adoption was also believed to be the best solution for these increasing numbers of infertile couples who could not have children of their own and who were looking for mostly white babies to adopt. And I am gonna talk about race in a minute here. So you can see in this report from 19, about 1961, that in Salvation Army maternity homes across the country, of which there are about, I think, 36 at the time, 71.6% of these women have their children adopted. Remember in 1920, the Salvation Army was saying, nope, we are keeping mothers and children together. Um, by 1961, 71.6% of these women are having their children adopted. It is a complete inversion of those numbers. And again, it is because it is thought that adoption is gonna solve all three of these problems for all three of these parties. Now, let me talk about race for a couple of minutes here. <clears throat> I should have said at the outset that this story that I'm telling about Booth and about my mother is largely a white woman's story and not just because my mother was a white woman, but because this experience of these women in the post-war period who get pregnant, go to maternity homes, have their babies, have them adopted, is by design and as a result of systemic racism, as well as cultural understandings of unwed motherhood, creates this path for white women primarily. So you can see from that same report about 1961 in Salvation Army maternity homes across the country, 85.6 of the women in residence at those homes are white. In the Central Territory of which Minnesota is a part, that proportion is even bigger. 91.5% of women at those homes run by the Salvation Army are white. Now, I want to make clear that most white women, even who get pregnant outside of marriage at this time, don't go to a maternity home. So it's still a minority of women who go to the maternity homes. But of those who do, the vast majority of them are white. Now, why is that? Well, that is for a number of reasons. Um, there's a, a, a woman who wrote a book in the 90s about these maternity homes, Ricky Solinger. And she has said that race was the single most important factor that determined what would happen to these women and their children. So if a, let's say black or Native American woman became pregnant outside of wedlock, they had a very different experience than somebody like my mom did for a number of reasons. Some, some of those reasons had to do with how Black and Native communities may have responded to single pregnancy in ways that were very different than this kind of white, middle-class, nuclear American family world responded to single pregnancy. In many cases, those young women from Black and Native American communities were absorbed into those communities. They had different ideas and different understandings about family, about um, responsibility, about, about who raises children. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, but there was also in, in conjunction with that, which explains this racial skew to some degree, there was also rampant racism within the predominantly white social welfare world. So if social welfare experts at the time were saying white women were neurotic, they had the psychological dysfunction that could be remedied through casework counseling and psychological treatment. For many years, these same experts thought that, well, yeah, but Black and, and Native American women, they 
are beyond help. They are so biologically distinct based on race that they're just acting out immutable biological instincts. And so the same kind of treatment that we're offering these white women wouldn't do anything for black and native women. So for a good number of years in certain circles, these social welfare experts just that, nah, you know, they're, they're let those communities tend to their own. What we're doing here is trying to restore these white women to their proper paths. <clears throat> now the Salvation Army um, very publicly said that it did not discriminate against anybody based on race or creed. So there is some evidence that there were some African-American and Native American women at Booth St. Paul, um, but still they were in the, in the vast, vast minority. Now then, Ricky Solinger also says that race determines what happened to those babies once they were born as well. So sometimes in Black and Native American communities, depending on where they were, um, those children were absorbed into the communities, into different family systems that had also absorbed their mothers. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, but if a Black or Indigenous woman got pregnant and for whatever reason wanted to have her child adopted away and raised by others, homes for non-white babies were difficult to find at this time as that middle headline suggests. Partly because this is the era of racial matching. Um, I, I won't talk about this at any length, but I will say that infertility carried as much stigma in many ways as unwed pregnancy did. And so for white couples who couldn't have children of their own in this very pro-natal era, it was really difficult to not be able to do that. And so adoption wasn't something that people talked openly about if that's how they were forming their families. And so people wanted children who looked like them. And if you're white, you can't hide the fact that you're building your family through adoption if you adopt a non-white child. So that's part of it. There's also definitely some you know, racist attitudes about that as well. Um, but there's also structural barriers to non-white couples who might have wanted to adopt non-white children. Uh, adoption is a hard um, system to work if you are trying to build your family that way. There are income requirements. There were requirements at the time that the mother in a prospective adoptive family had to be a stay-at-home mother. So if you are living in a world, if you are non-white and living in a world that is systemically biased against the non-white and you have to have both the husband and wife working, you are excluded from agency adoption. You are not eligible to adoption. There are housing requirements that many people who don't have access to a middle-class lifestyle cannot afford. So there are structural barriers to the adoption of children of color by parents of color as well. And so what happens um, as the 60s wear on, the civil rights movement is coming along um, and there, are, there starts to be within the social welfare community a liberalizing attitudes where some social workers are saying, no, 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 we have to offer black and native um, and Latino women the same services we offer white women. And we need to expand the prospects of adoption to non-white adopters. So there are efforts, including here in Minnesota, to expand adoption as a possibility both for non-white babies and non-white adopters. Um, there's a program in Minnesota that runs for a few years in the early 60s called PAMI, the Program to Adopt Minority Youngsters, which is the article on the bottom here. And it starts out as an effort to make sure Black couples can adopt black children. But soon, very soon, it turns into a program that really is focused on transracial adoption. So we start seeing even this program, PAMI, ends up placing far more of these um, black babies into white homes. Um, they are also expanding uh, adoption eligibility for prospective adopters by saying, hey, even if you're white and single, you can adopt a child of color. 
So these efforts soon kind of morph into an emphasis on transracial adoption. Um, and of course, probably most of us are familiar with, um, at least to some degree, the history and legacy of how that attempt um, to find children for white adopters really has a devastating effect on Native American communities through something like the Indian Adoption Project. I'm not gonna to spend too much time talking about it here. I'm watching the clock a little bit, but I do write about it in the book a little bit. I will say though, that in Minnesota in 1971, when Native Americans constituted only 0.6% of the state's population, almost 25% of Native children, one in four, who were under a year old, were placed for adoption in white families. There are many reasons for this that, again, I'm not going to go into here, but it was a devastating impact on the Native American community through a program like the Indian Adoption Project. So what we see happening here is this move towards transracial adoption for children of color. And of course, that leads to transnational and transracial adoption, which is where my family comes in many years later. So, oh, there's the mute button. Now I find it too late. So here's what my mom had to say about the experience of having her baby adopted away and her thoughts about what was called the best solution. Nine months of pregnancy doesn't hurt, but nine months of unwed mother pregnancy can hurt very badly. I made up my mind early in my gestation that I would give my baby up for adoption rather than have it start life as an illegitimate little person doomed to failure because of me. Truth is, I didn't wanna take on the responsibility either which made me feel even more worthless than I already did. So these women, women like my mom, were making these, quote, decisions in an era in which their options were extraordinarily limited, both by moral accusation, by structural limitations, and by the fact that all the adult authorities around them were saying to them, it will be best for your baby if you have it adopted by a family that can take better care of it than you can. I'm gonna talk about this very, very quickly because it's, it was an amazing find for me as a historian. Um, you know, Part of the reason I decided to interview people about their experiences at Booth is because I, want, I couldn't talk to my mom about it and I wanted to understand what it was like, what it would have been like for her to be at Booth. And so I was, I interviewed these seven women who had had similar experiences, but they were talking about experiences 50 years in the past. What I found at the University of Minnesota archives though is this treasure trove of interviews that a social work professor, a longtime social work professor at the university, Gisela Kanapka, went in to in 1963 and interviewed adolescent girls who were at Booth while they were there, while they were pregnant, while they were struggling with these decisions. And so in this collection of interviews, you can hear these young women talking about how they're processing what they're going through and what they're thinking about um, doing with their babies. And so you hear a wide range of voices, including this one from this 19 year old white girl who had already delivered her baby and said that it's better that I bear the grief and the mark instead of the child. It was my mark, not his. In other words, much like my mom, they thought they were doing the best thing for their babies by not having them suffer the stigma that they had suffered. After the delivery, I saw the baby before he was cleaned up and again after he was cleaned up. He had dark features and hair like me. It was hard for me to give him up, but I realized he would have a happy home. These are really heartbreaking interviews, but they're at the University of Minnesota archives and you can go and, and read them and hear what these young women were saying in their own words at the time. Here I'm, are a few um, quotes from the women that I interviewed and their thoughts about whether or not adoption was the best solution. 
And again, even in you know, among my very tiny pool of interviewees, seven people, they had a, a range of attitudes about this. Gay had her baby in 1959. They got working on me and it worked, it worked. They got my baby. I knew my choice was that I had no choice. Pam had her baby in 1961. I knew from the outset that I would be giving my child up for adoption. I had no resources or means to keep a child. I was 17 years old and I just knew that that's what I needed to do. Sandy B, however, was one of the women that I interviewed and she actually kept her baby. They were trying to push you to adoption, she told me, you know, and of course, stubborn me, the more they pushed towards adoption, the more I said, no, I'm going to keep them. So not all of these women did have their children adopted. Sandy went home with her son. She got pregnant a couple of years later, again, outside of marriage, however, and that baby, a daughter, she did surrender for adoption. And she said she did that because she knew she wasn't giving her son, that whom she had kept, a good life. So these are very, very difficult situations and very difficult um, decisions to make. So um, I'm gonna head towards winding up here so we do have some time for discussion. Uh, suffice it to say that after my mom has her baby in 1961, my sister is adopted and raised by her adoptive parents. My mother leaves Booth, um, goes on and as I said at the beginning, doesn't talk about this for 33 years. She marries, she has that promised fresh start. She has me, she has my brother, she has a job. Um, at that time, as my mother is resuming her life, uh, Booth is going through an interesting period. It's during the 60s, the sexual revolution is happening, the civil rights movement is happening, cultural mores and attitudes are changing. There's less demand for the kind of secretive services of these maternity homes by unmarried pregnant women. And yet during that time, during the 60s, Booth is undergoing this massive fundraising campaign to expand the facility. It's very controversial. I will not go into the details here. It's a very controversial move. They do not have the support of many of the governing, the local governing hospital commissions who are saying, look, this is kind of becoming outdated. We have lots of general hospitals here where pregnant girls can deliver their babies. We don't need to expand the hospital facilities at Booth. Um, nevertheless, they do secure the funds and in 1969, they open a new wing, the wing that is currently still to the east of that original building to um, less fanfare than the original opening, but they do open it in 1969. And then literally two years later, Booth as a maternity home is on decline. Um, there's a study that finds that its program is out of date. It is not keeping up with today's um, young pregnant women need. And um, aside from that, just culturally things have changed. Young pregnant women, who are single by the end of the 60s, early 70s are not seeking shelter at these maternity homes in the ways they once were. And that brings the end of Booth Memorial Hospital as a home and hospital for unmarried women. So in 1971, they closed the hospital altogether. They still admit pregnant girls to the residential program, but they send them all to the University of Minnesota for delivery. Um, incidentally, the university has a long relationship with Booth, which I will not talk about now. Um, and then in 1973, they close the Unwed Mothers program altogether, and they start um, turning it into Booth Brown House, which initially begins as a program for girls who are caught in the juvenile court system, and then evolves into what it is now, where it is a transitional program for um, young people in general. But you can see the, whoops, the expansion here. This is what opens in 1969, a dramatic <laughs> style difference from the original home. Um, so both Booth and my mom, you know, by 1970 are on that fresh start um, of their own, neither of which was easy. And uh, like I said, my mother kept her secret for 33 years until my sister came back. And so in many ways I consider my family.
a booth found. And there we all are before my mother dies. So I'm going to stop there. I'm looking at my clock. It's about 10 after 2. I'm going to stop my screen share, put my video on, and um, open it up to any kind of question or discussions. And again, many apologies for the coughing throughout this presentation. I appreciate your forbearance and your patience. Hi, I'm Laura Oyen, and um, I live just a couple blocks from Booth Brown House, and we've been doing a little research in our um, neighborhood about the different institutions of it. And I was wondering if in your research, if you ran across anything about the Magdalene Society and the Minneapolis Children's Center, it happened to be just down the block at 1245 Hamlin. You know, not not much the Magdalene society maybe just brief mention um and but what was the second one the minneapolis children's center? children's center yes it was I, it was the same address and i think they just changed their name over time but they were also an orphanage um basically two blocks from the booth brown home so um and they were right on the corner here of hamlin and um all Almond and Albany, which is just okay. one block off of Como. So oh, just very close by. So and what years, what years was it operating? You know? Um the information um I was able to find there was a um 1961, it was the Minnesota Children's Center. Uh there was a fire there in 1961. And then it was also in the Daily Globe in 1880. They published oh. an article about it. Um, oh. And so part of my interest in this also is we have an awful lot of institutions in this neighborhood um, from what used to be the old Shalom home. And I wondered if that was any connection to the people who funded Booth Brown. We have Ling Bloomston here. We have, <coughs> right. Lynn, um, you know, just lots of institutions in this very small area. So I was wondering in your research if you ran across any of that. Yeah, no. Well, only in passing. And so, you know, I certainly wasn't, I was looking specifically for the Salvation Army and, and that kind of stuff. So no, I, I'm afraid I can't offer too much insight on those other particular institutions. Um, but it is interesting that they are all concentrated in this kind of relatively small mm -hmm. area um, and, and popping up at the similar times, at least. And, and who was it that ran the Magdalene? Um, it was, um, it started from the Women's Christian Association of St. Paul. Okay. Um, and then they talk about the Magdalene Society and the Union Gospel Mission Home are okay. some of okay. the other. Maybe we can, I can connect you offline with some of the information or something like that. Yeah. Um, there is actually even one other right across the street from the east section of Booth Brown Home was mm -hmm. um, there's a church and it used to be the Lake Park Baptist Church. Okay. And I did find something in there that it over time evolved into a uh, Angora Community Center. So I don't know if that mm -hmm. um, also had um, any connection at all um, to the programming at Booth or anything. Yeah, not that I have seen. And okay. so in terms of sources, you know, I, as I said, I, I mind, mind everything I could find at the Minnesota Historical Society. And there's, there's not a lot from the Salvation Army itself. Um, like I could not find any records from the Salvation Army, either at the Historical Society or at the Salvation Army archives that would speak to you know, staff, what I wanted to find was I wanted to look at staff notes, you know, if they were having meetings and talking about how they wanted to help these young women, what were they saying to each other about what their mission was to the, with these young women? And those records either do not exist or are not available to the public. Mm -hmm. um, the Salvation Army National Archives, I think, still has uh, like all the confidential records about the women in residence who were there. And of course, they were at one point 
they did make those available to the public. They are not available to the public now. So I had to come at it kind of through all these oblique angles, including at the Minnesota Historical Society and the University of Minnesota Social Welfare History Archives. And so I would look at things like the United Way. I don't know if you've looked at any of those records, but the United, that, that might, that's where I found a lot, a lot of information about Booth in its early years because Booth relied to a large degree on public funding and fundraising that came through an organization like the United Way. They had a lot of records about what was happening at Booth. They were all external, right? Mm -hmm. It was talking about um, uh, fundraising issues and staffing issues and, and what the home was doing and is it worthy of our time and money. Um, I also found a lot of information about Booth through local regulatory agencies, the State Board of Control, which turns into you know, various other entities along the way. On the, the, I forget the exact name and they change over the years, but the local, um, in this case, hospital planning agencies had a lot to say about what was happening in organizations like Booth because they licensed them and they provided funding. So, so you might find information about these institutions through those kinds of sources, funders and regulatory agencies. Even if you can't find you know, an archival collection from these organizations themselves, look at those uh, associated records because those records exist. Um, Great, thanks. Yeah. Yep. We have a question in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. That's uh, we live on the corner of Como and Pascal, 1457 Como, and they have heard um, that their house used to be staff housing for Booth. Did you happen to find any research about the staff and where they lived? You know what, not specifically, but I think that's true. And I'm trying to think of why I think that if I came across it in research or it might be just, you know, I visited Booth, I have visited Booth Brown House a few times and it might've been some of the current staff who said, oh yes, you know, our staff used to live across the street. They also had an extension that they had built onto the north side of the old booth, you know, the, the historic house, which is on the National Register, I think, um, that would have, would have faced this house. And that got torn down. I'm not even sure when that happened. But you can see old photographs. There was an, another addition to the building there. But I believe that is correct. I, know, I believe, I'm not sure of the exact address, but I believe that yes, staff did live in a house across the street from Booth. There is a book out there called The Boy, the Boy at Booth Memorial, The Boy from Booth Memorial, something like that. It's a fictionalized account written by a man whose mother was a nurse who worked at Booth and she lived there for a while with him. And so he grew up for a year, <laughs> you know, kind of surrounded by the Salvation Army staff and these young women, and, so, and he's written a book about it. So that might even have something about, you know, more, that has more details about the experiences of the staff at Booth. But I think that's correct. That was a long answer to say, yes, I think that's correct. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, I have a couple other questions unless someone else wants to jump in. Okay, the first one, have any other mothers child, mothers or children reached out to you after um, uh, your talks and your book was published that, you know, aren't the interviews that you have and, um, yes, uh, you know, since you've been giving talks and things like that? Yes, it's amazing. You know, even, even during the, the many years, I mean, this book, it took me many years. I'm not a prolific writer um, of research. And even as I was talking about it during the research stage at, at various events like this, almost always somebody has a connection, sometimes to Booth, this Booth specifically, sometimes to the experience as a whole. But yes, I have heard from a number of other women who delivered babies there or other people who were born at Booth as well. And oftentimes they call or they get in touch and they want to know if I have any suggestions for how they can find each other if they haven't reunited with their, if they were adopted, 
and they haven't reunited with each other, they want um, suggestions and ideas for how they can find each other. Um, I'm not a searcher. I didn't do the search. My sister did that. Mm -hmm. But I, I do have some suggestions for people if that's what they're trying to do. So, but yes, I have, I have. Um, the other question I had is, um, we're going to be trying to do more oral history um, collections of people who live in Como or, or grandparents or whatever stories from Como. And um, how did you or how would you figure out good questions to ask or if um, if you're not haven't done this before is there a template of good questions to um, to ask as a oral historian that's a big question with a big answer and I say that only because that's what I've taught you know at St. Kate's I used oral history in my classes I have my own oral history consulting business now I provide workshops to people to do that kind of training. I, you know, I do periodic trainings with students at Carleton College. Um, is there a general template? No. Is there a general set of guidelines and suggestions? Yes. Um, I would be happy to talk to you about that more, you know, kind of off, off this channel as well. You can also look at, you can look at my website, which is just spotlightoralhistory.com. Um, for information on, on me and what I do. But then there's also the National Oral History Association. And I, that's not their website. You can just Google the name, but the National Oral History Association has a whole section of their website dedicated to resources with links to um, you know, other programs, to suggested forms, to, you know, how do you start, how do you form and start an oral history project? But I would be happy to talk to you about that as well. It's, it's a great, it's a great way of learning history if you can do it for sure. I'm uh, pausing to see if other people <laughs> want to ask questions because I do have another question. <laughs> anyone, anyone? Yeah. Bueller, Bueller. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll jump in with this one also. Um, have you, there was recently, I saw a Facebook um, chain from Old St. Paul, and they talked about an African-American St. Paul's crisp addicts home and orphanage. Yes. Um, do you have any information on that, or did you run across that? Yes, that one. And I'm not going to be able to remember any of it right now, but yes, there has been some stuff written about the Christmas Addicts home. Um, and I want to say, oh, I think one of the Elsinger brothers, one of them dies relatively early on, and then the other one goes on to live for many more years. But I think one of them, one or both of them might have been involved in sponsoring or funding or contributing to that home as well. Um, and, and can you remind me, do you know where it was? I feel like it's in the St. Anthony neighborhood. Um, I'm not sure park? this is the part I read. It was closer to downtown St. Paul and it okay. might have moved out this direction again, going to like, you know, we were in the country at the point in time when right. these, um, areas were, uh, blooming or, you know, being yes. built and things like that. Um, but why didn't they move east? Why did they move west? Why did they move between here and Minneapolis? And maybe that was the answer there. But, um, right. you know, we have universities all along Snelling Avenue that mm -hmm. were, you know, moved out this direction. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's just kind of an interesting neighborhood with the types of institutions that yeah. are in this well, direction. And Well, here's a question for you or Sarah or anybody on the, on the call. How far east, I should know the answer to this, but how far east did the streetcar line go? It went to, um, I think, Como and 280 because then it switched to the Minneapolis line, the same up uh, the third, um, the number three went up Como Avenue. So I think it, um, it may have gone to Snelling too. It depends on the point in time. Because I know they, that, because it, it went by Booth. Because that was one of one of you know in some of the early newspaper accounts was that oh yes it's right on the streetcar line so I wonder though 
um, if that has anything to do with why things would have gone west, mm-hmm. you know, developed or moved west rather than east. I don't know. We did have all the Como shops too over at Bandana Square. So um, there were um, stations and things like that with the Tilden School. I remember reading about um, a teacher took the, um, you know, the train or whatever version up to um, Snelling and then walk to the school. So, okay. okay. Interesting. Interesting. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep, Nan. <laughs> it's sort of like Almond Avenue is yeah, um, represented. Uh, <laughs> um, just two things. One, um, to the question about the Magdalens, my understanding is that the Good Shepherd Home, which was not far from here, um had unwed mothers and there were two groups of nuns the good shepherd sisters and the magdalens the magdalens were former unwed not unwed mothers oh that um, makes sense with the sense. title yes yeah. and that was just a little bit the other side of lexington <coughs> at the good shepherd home was. So um, that's number one. Number two is Kim and I and a few other people are working on an oral history project and Kim is doing a great job. So she would be a good person to visit with. Thanks, Nan. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. It's just getting started. yeah, on the oral history face to face. So I'm really looking forward to that one too. So thank you. Good. Yeah. Sarah, oral history, you, it's a great thing. Did you want to share what we're doing with St. Kate's students or? I'm, I think, you, Laura, you should tell, you are great at explaining it right now, if you don't mind. <laughs> and you've done um, this. <laughs> Well, you, you I, I know Mary and Trish, I'm not sure where you folks live, but Sarah, myself and Anne all live on the same street. And uh, so this is, it's really kind of sweet. We're all on here together and working this together. But um, uh, Sarah is the lead on our neighbor relations um, committee. And we've been trying to um, do research on the neighborhood, the historic um, parts of the neighborhood in relationship to racial covenants that were um, in place. And specifically, there was the Frankson edition, which is Midway Parkway going north, um, had racial covenants, yet Midway Parkway going south did not. But um, over the last couple of years, um, year and a half, we've connected up with um, the Dear Neighbor, Welcome Dear Neighbor project at St. Kate's, and um, also some of their staff and various people there. And um, I believe they're going to be having some students helping us collect oral histories um, of um, neighbors or whoever we would like to get, um, uh, have their history of the neighborhood recorded. We're also trying to work that into some walking paths and then ultimately have a reflection um, exhibit, bench, reflective space, maybe on Midway Parkway or something nice. to think about the history of the neighborhood, how it's developed, things like that. Um, I myself like doing research and I haven't figured out how to write the things down yet because of working and things like that. But um, you know, we've been digging up a lot of interesting things just on our little block around here. Yeah. You know, Magdalene Society being at one end of the block, Booth Brown, you know, a little bit over. Tilden Park was one of the first schools in St. Paul, is just a diagonal from Booth Brown, basically. And um so yeah, so we're trying to work with St. Kate students uh, over the summer and um, hopefully get these, get recordings or, or um, transcripts or stories all within the project um, called Know Your Como that is hosted on the District 10 website that Sarah has been instrumental and her team um, in neighbor relations and various other uh, wonderful writers in the neighborhood who've been going out and interviewing mm-hmm you know, people, 
and we're trying to get places and things into there too. So this is uh, Booth Brown is kind of a places um, story. So yeah. uh, figuring out how to add more to that and oh, and that's great. Like that. that, yeah, that's fantastic. Are you working with um, Deanne Urban Urbaniak Lesh at St. Kate's? Um, no, who are we working with, um, Sarah? Um, I am really bad at remembering names off the top of my head. I'll have to go back in my email. Okay, uh, Rachel, here, let's and... see. We're working okay. with Christine I'm... West and um... Rachel. Rachel, Rachel Nywart. Yep. 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 And her students, um, Michaela and, um, and we're working with another woman, um, Marsha Anderson, who used to work at the Historical Society. And mm -hmm. so she's a resident of Como also. And so we've been kind of a little subgroup trying to um, keep this moving forward and stuff and yeah. figuring out how to ultimately get it on the website, have it more interactive um, so people could walk by. Um, things but, of that nature, but we're I a little know, over. We are over time. Sorry, Laura. And I don't want to take up any more of Kim's time, but this was such a great, great presentation. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you everybody for joining us and listening. And we will be posting your talk. So thank you so much. I'm going to end recording now. Um, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. And there's my email in the chat if anybody wants to reach.